Philippians chapter 1. We're going to read verse number 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6. Familiar scripture. Yeah. I will tell you this, when I was uh, searching for a title for this, and, uh, I was going to make a graphic. I noticed that Brother Brandon actually preached this title uh, about two months ago now. And, uh, I said, well, I'm just going to use the same graphic I used for him. <laughs> Amen. But Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, Be it confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work yes. in you will perform it until the day oh, yeah. of Jesus Christ. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. You know, I used to sing a song to my kids when they were babies. And... Um, Sister Melissa is going to come up and sing it here a little while and play it. Um, but it was called He's Still Working on Me. And uh, the song was written by Joel Hemphill. And it teaches the truth of Philippians 1 and 6 yeah. and being confident, meaning I'm sure of this very thing that He which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God began a work in us. And God is still working in us, and he will until he's completed, which means he is still working on me. And just one part of that song, it says, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. And that's what I want to preach on tonight, is he's still working on me. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. The image of God in us is woven throughout the scripture. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 explains that we are living stones, that the Lord is shaping, that the Lord is growing and building up into a spiritual house. And we're left with a picture of the Lord with uh, a chisel in his hand, cutting away at the pieces that, that don't belong. And fashioning us, fashioning us according to his plan. And we can also see as a picture, as you see on the screens, of being on a potter's wheel. Being molded into what the potter wants us to be. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 we're described as God's workmanship. We're described as his handiwork. His masterpiece. As though the Lord is the painter and we are the canvas where he creates a work of art for his glory. When we think about all the, the beauty that we've seen in this world. I don't know how many he's had the privilege to see Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon and and, and other, you know, marvel, marvel things that we marvel at and, and the beauty thereof. And, uh, but, you know, and all those things that God created and all those beautiful things that he created, yet you and I are still up here above those things yes, because we are his best creation. Yes, amen. We are to him his greatest creation. Amen. amen. And... Uh, whether you've been striving for years, or maybe you recently embraced this biblical vision of this great gospel, the scriptures assure us that God is not finished with you yet. He's that skilled craftsman. He's that creative artist. He's that uh, one that's chiseling and cutting and shaping and painting and uh, sanctifying, which means purifying us and our and our families until this work is complete. Right. Amen. Amen. And, and, and oftentimes we can use the terminology of pruning uh, that, you know, he's got to cut things back. And that's what hurts sometimes when right. he cuts things back. But but we have to be able to, to stand there and allow him to, to prune things away from us that are, are hindering our walk with him. 
Uh, I mean, he knows better than any of us, amen, what's hindering our walk with him. So if we can give him the opportunity to prune those things away or, or, or to chisel away, chisel away or cut away those things, uh, that's all a part of the work that he's doing in us. Um, you see, none of us, none of us has arrived yet. That's right, amen. We are all still works in progress. And you know, I, I'm glad today that I'm not where I used to be. And yes. I'm glad I'm not do, out doing the things that I used to do and living the way that I used to to live. Amen. And But as we travel toward eternity, how many know that's what we're doing every single day? Amen. All right, we're traveling toward eternity and it's either going to be by the way of the grave, or it's going to be by him coming back. It's one of those two. But we're traveling toward eternity. And we and in, in traveling toward eternity, we've got to remember that, that we are just mere uh, uh, clay in the potter's hands. All right. And he's working on all of us right now. And let me tell you, he has a great plan for us in eternity. Hey, Amen. We read in Revelations of what heaven looks like and the streets of gold, the walls of jasper and all the, the pearly gates and all the other beautiful things that are there. Amen. He's already has that prepared for you and I. And that's why today I'm glad that whenever I begin to maybe swerve just a little bit or, or, or start to lean toward a detour that he comes in and he begins to do that pruning. He begins that, that, that trimming on me and, and reminds me that, hey, I've got a bigger plan for you. That I'm still working on you. And, uh, and, and if we're all honest today, we don't like the way he works on us sometimes. But it's always going to be for our good. Amen. This, the reason we don't like it is because this flesh is in enmity with God. And enmity means hatred. This flesh, our flesh hates God. Amen. Our flesh hates God. Amen. That's why we, we battle so much against the things that God wants us to do. But I'm so glad that he's still working on me. Ephesians 1 and 6, as we read as our text, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That phrase Till the day of Jesus Christ is the day of his appearance. When he comes back and he'll be the judge of the world. And that's when you and I, the work that he started in us, will be complete. Amen. But Paul uses a strong word here to describe uh, the hope that he has in Jesus. And that word is confident. Confident means to persuade, to convince beyond all doubt. Why? So what Paul is saying here in this verse is that he has been persuaded beyond all doubt that God will complete what he started. He will complete what he started. Yes. Amen. Amen. And he also uses another word uh, as we see that it says that God begun a good work in you. He uses the word you. And the word you, it makes this very scripture become personal. And how many remember me telling you that when you read the word of God, you make it personal. Yes. You insert your name in it. You, in, you, you insert your name in this situation, in that situation. For God so loved the world. For God so loved Kenneth. And, and being confident that he begun a good work in Kenneth, he will perform it until the day of his return. Amen. So Paul uses this word you, and it makes it personal. And, and this assurance that he speaks of is, is very personal in nature. Because you need to know, and you need to know based on evidence, you need to know based on the word of God, not the word of another, because you see, my mother told me I was saved is not good enough. That's why I try to, to make sure I'm not telling somebody they received the Holy Ghost. 
I want them to tell me they received the Holy Ghost. Because if they receive the Holy Ghost, there's going to be an excitement about them. They're going to know it. Amen. So, Mama told me I was saved is not good enough. Daddy told me I was saved is not good enough. We need to know for ourselves. You need to know. You need to know for yourself. And you need to know beyond the shadow of a doubt. Amen. And then when the words have begun, Paul covers a lot of spiritual territory here. We all know what God did for us the day he saved us. But we fail to consider, what we fail to consider is the fact that our salvation process began long before we realized it. Jeremiah tells us that he that God loved us before we even existed. Mm -hmm. Ephesians tells us that God chose us even before the world was found. Long before you and I received salvation, he was already working. Yes. Thousands of years ago. You see, when he went on the cross, it's not just a story that we're to tell. And, and, and to mess with people's emotions. But he started and he, he God wrote himself in the flesh and came to this earth and walked this earth, roamed through this earth for 33 and a half years as a perfect spotless man. And he went to Calvary. He died on that cross. It wasn't so we could just sit around and tell a story. But that was already the salvation in the works for you and I. Amen. So he had begun. Amen. In other words, the Lord has made a substantial investment into our salvation. And let me tell you, I cannot see him walking out on us now. I can't see him ever walking out, us, uh, out on us at any given time. The Bible says that he would never leave us nor forsake us. God did not do what he did in vain. He did it to save our souls. And then, then Paul tells us that we're, we're told that the same God who began this good work will perform it. Mm -hmm. That those three words there, will perform it, this phrase means to bring to an end, to complete, to accomplish entirely, to furnish completely. God never does anything halfway. Yes. It's always complete. Amen. Yes. So God will continue the work that he has begun in you. He will continue the work that he has begun in me until the day that we are perfected, that we are completed, that, that we are finally home with him. Do we understand tonight that the end goal is to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, to enter into the joys of the Lord. I don't know about you tonight, but I want God to still work on me. I want God to, to hurt this flesh. I want God to carve this flesh. I want God to chisel away at this flesh. Because, Sister Freedom, when it comes to the end, I want to hear the words, well done. I do not want to hear the words, depart from me. If I hear those words, that means somewhere along the way. I said, God, I got this. God, I can do this on my own. I don't need you. God. I can handle every situation, but no, God, I stand before you tonight. I can't handle that situation. I can't do this on my own. I can't walk without you, God. Prune my life, God. Cut away things that don't need to be there, God, and make me and mold me into what you want me to be. He's still working on me. Look, don't get frustrated with the construction that's going on in your soul. Don't get frustrated with the, the pruning that he's doing. Don't get frustrated with that, that trimming. And you, 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 there's some things we like to do in the flesh that in and of themselves, they are not sin. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. But be 
because we continue to do them, yes. we take away from our time in this. We take away from our time in prayer. Come on, come on. Remember, it's not a sin. Remember, Paul said to lay aside every what? Weight right. and sin. Uh -huh. So that was a weight at one point, but now we've allowed that to come in and, and, and come before the things of God, and we get frustrated, we get aggravated when God whispers to us, turn that TV off. Uh -huh. come on. Turn that computer off. Put that book down and pick up this word of mine. We get frustrated with that. But we got to understand that we can't get frustrated with that construction that's going on. That's God trying to prune us. That's God trying to remind us that, that I still have a work that I started in you. And I'm going to complete that work. That I need you to lay these weights down before they become a sin in your life. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And if we're not careful... We'll, lay, we'll, we'll, we'll put those things before God. Yes. And those weights, fear's not sin. Right. Worry's not sin. Stress is not sin. That's but guess good. what? If you let it hang around too long, All right. All right. Good. if you let it hang around too long, before long, you're going to say, well, I don't need to go to church today. Uh -oh. I, you know, I just, and next thing you know, you're going to be over there in a the corner and you're going to start enjoying your little pity party. That's true. Come on. And my theory on pity parties are only three people show up, me, myself, and I. <laughs> but we lay aside, and then we start laying out of church. Yeah. We start laying out of church, we stop reading the Bible. We stop we start laying out of church, we stop reading the Bible, we're gonna stop praying. Yeah. Next thing you know, God's gonna be trying to gonna, gonna try to prune us, gonna try to trim us, uh, trim and chisel away those things from us. And what do we do? We get aggravated. What's the use? Nothing's going right anyway. Come on, come on. All because we didn't want God to chisel away at this thing that our flesh was enjoying. But I want to stand here tonight and declare, devil, I'm going to allow the de uh, God to continue to work on me. I'm going to allow God to trim away those things that don't need to be in my life. Yeah, they're not a sin, but they're a weight. And they're starting to cause me to, 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 to get weary in my walk with God. They're going to cause me to begin to get weary in my knees that I don't, what I don't want to get before God. But church, it's a good thing to know that God is pruning away, that he's chiseling away and he's trimming away those things, uh, those weights that are on us. Uh, I don't know about you but I'm glad that I can stand here tonight uh, and say he's still working on me. Can we say proudly tonight uh, that he's still working on me? Can we say with a godly pride tonight uh, I stand before you God. I don't know what's going on uh, but if there's anything in my life uh, that needs to be trimmed away. That needs to be cut away. No matter what it is, God, are you willing or are you bold enough to say, God, take it away? Are you bold enough to say, take that entertainment away from me, God, because it's causing me to not read your word. It's causing me not to pray. It's causing me not to fast. It's causing me, God, not to do a work that you want me to do. Submit ourselves to God so He can remove it. The Bible tells us that if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us. But we seem to conveniently forget that first part. It says if you submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. No need to get aggravated when the devil's in your face and you haven't submitted yourself to God. Because when you submit yourself to God, you're saying, God, come in with the scissors. God, come in with the chisel. Come in with whatever you need, God. I want you to take it away from me. I want a life that's pleasing to you. I want to walk this walk that's pleasing to you. I want to know that beyond the shadow of a doubt that you've worked on me. And when that work is completed, I hear, well done. A lot of times when we 
think about God's love. We're thinking about the things that he's given us. We think about the care. We think about the love. We think, we think about the, the, you know, all these things that make us feel good on the inside. But some of the greatest love that he has ever shown us is when he got those scissors out, those pruning shears out, and he began to prune away those things. You see, if he didn't love you, he wouldn't be working on you. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't try to trigger that. I can't do that. I, I can't. That's going to keep me out of church. That's going to keep me out of the word of God. That's going to keep me from my prayer closet. That's going to keep me from fasting. You see, those little thoughts won't come in your mind if God didn't love you. So I'm here to tell you tonight that the main thing you need to understand when God begins to prove you, that's enough of his greatest love that he can ever show you besides when he went to the cross. When this flesh that hates God begins to hurt, begins to be in sorrow, that ought to remind you that God loves me so much that he's willing to come down. Out of near 8 billion people on this earth, he'll come down to where I'm at and say, I love you, daughter. I love you, son. Here's some things we need to get out. I know it's going to hurt the flesh. I know it's going to hurt, but we need to get it out. So when that day speak to you and I can say to you well done Amen. just a listen to you God. oh we praise you Jesus the story is told of a sculptor whose statue of a horse fascinated and caught the attention of everyone one day he was asked how did you take such an ugly, unpretentious piece of stone and make such a beautiful horse? His answer was simple. I simply chipped away everything that didn't look like a horse. You see, that is what God is doing in your life and in my life. Through the loss of a job, through the death of a loved one, through the betrayal of a friend, or, or, or a life-changing addiction, through it all. God is at work in your life to chip away anything and everything that doesn't look like Him. I've learned this. If God was powerful enough to bring you to something, He is also powerful enough to bring you through something. Yes, sir. Amen. God was powerful enough to help you descend into the valley. He is also powerful enough to help you ascend onto the mountain. Yes, amen. He's not going to leave us where he found us. Thank you, Jesus. Think about a painter who saw a beggar whose clothes were, were tattered and his hair was unkept and he was just dirty. He was a beggar. And the artist decided to paint the man as he might have looked as a successful businessman with a wonderful family. Yes. And when it was finished, the painter invited the beggar to come see the painting. The beggar didn't recognize himself, and he asked, is that me? The painter said, that's what I see in you. For the first time in years, the beggar was given hope. And the beggar said, by God's grace, I'm going to be that kind of man you see me to be. Can I tell you tonight that that's what God wants you to see in yourself. He wants you to see what he sees in you. He sees in you a victor. He sees in you more than a conqueror. 
He sees in you a daughter and a son of His. He's still working on me. At the moment we give ourselves, God takes this, this raw material and He begins to shape it into the life that He sees today. And what we will be one day. Think about it. The same God who stepped out from the curtain of nowhere onto the platform of nothing and he spoke a world into existence. Yes. That is the same God that is working on you tonight. Yes. The same God that sustained four million Israelites with manna and water for 40 years so that none died of starvation. That is the same God that is working on you tonight. The same God who delivered those three boys from their personal barbecue, if you would. He delivered them. So, I mean, the fire was so hot that it destroyed the men that threw them in. But he delivered them and not even a hair on their head was burnt. The Bible said they didn't even smell like smoke. That's the same God that's working on you tonight. The same God that opened up the eyes of the blind. That unstopped the deaf ears. That loosened the silence of the dumb. That cleansed the disease and the unclean. That crashed funerals and brought the dead back to life. He is the same God tonight that is working on you. The God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God who is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The same God who was dead, yet three days later rose up and holds the keys to hell and death. That is the same God that is working on you tonight. Thanks be to God that I'm not what I used to be. And I, I know that I'm not what I should be just yet. But I'm like Paul, Brother Phillips. I am confident. I am confident of this very thing. That he, the almighty one, Amen. the creator of this universe, that my God has begun to work in me. Yes. And I'm confident that he will perform it. And that day comes, I want to look into his eyes. And I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful. Would you stand to your feet tonight? Is he working on you tonight? She's about to sing this little children's song that we, we grew up singing and listening to. But I don't want us just to sit there and reminisce. But I want to open these altars tonight for anyone in here that, that you're going to say, God... Here's some particular things I need you to work on in me. And as she begins to sing, would you come to these altars? We don't have to come lay hands on you. If you would come and kneel at this altar. I say, God, work on me. Work on me. Get those spiritual pruning shears out, God. And take things away that don't need to be there. Sister Melissa, would you say, if that's you tonight, would you come? Or maybe you just want to give thanks to him tonight and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for still working on me. Is there anybody else 
Thank you, God, for still working on me. There are some things that still need to be taken out, but God, I want to thank you that you're working on me tonight. Showing me how much you love me.